Welcome to the Disrupt in the Future podcast, episode three, season one, streaming on all platforms now. This one is a special one. It features Tamim, Georgi, two amazing CTAs within the Salesforce space. Also, don't forget myself, Hemi Sabal, and the amazing Asha Kennedy. Stream it now. Enjoy. Mic check, mic check. We are here. We are live. New podcast, season one, episode three, Salesforce special, Disrupt in the Future. And yes... The man, the myth, the legend has relocated to Dubai, and I am with a regular on the Disrupts in the Future podcast. I feel like I'm crushing your party, Asha Kennedy. How are you, Ash? I'm great, thank you. How are you? Do you know what? It's good to be here with you, man. Like, I've, I think we've come across each other. We will now work together. You're now involved in the Salesforce world, so thank you for joining this one. I know that you've done a lot in the product world, uh, fitness world as well. I wanted to bring you on this one because... You know, I think you know me. I'm, I mention the word legend a lot, but these are genuinely two Salesforce legends. Like, it's so rare to even get a CTA in a room. But we've got two Salesforce CTAs in a room. Let me just break it down very quickly for you, Ash, and the people watching as well. We've got one that has lived in many parts of the world, including Holland, Singapore, started a business last year called Stratus Carter, one of the fastest growing companies within comms cloud and SFI. And then we've got another CTA who did wonders around the world, especially in the UK, working with some of the biggest institutions and also has a top selling book that's on the second publication, not the first, the second publication. So with all that being said, I think it's only fair. It's only right that we introduce the legends themselves. We've got Georgi and we've got Tamim live in the flesh together. Gents, it's good to have you here. How are you? First of all, Yogi, Tamim, how's it's, things? It's good to be on. I'm glad that we that we got Tamim, the the man that wrote the book on CTA. I know. And yeah, I'm glad to be here. Thanks for inviting us. I think hopefully after this, Tamim, if you can get us to CTA, that would be appreciated. It was, it was one of the main <laughs> things. <so. laughs> we, we've been doing a little bit of research on the book, but look, something that we'll go deeper into. I think, Ash, we had a lot of questions coming in and we had to narrow yes, it down. Did, so. Yeah. You know, we've got you guys together in one room. It's rare. It's not often that that happens. I think people in the ecosystem are going to benefit a lot from not just your advice technically, but the fact that we're all in Dubai. And speaking about Dubai, the reason that Asher's here is to me, he is Mr. Dubai. You know, a lot of people come to you about advice, relocation. Talk us through it, man. Yeah, so I, you guys have both lived in various parts of the world and you've now come here in Dubai. So it'd be great for our audience to know essentially why Dubai. Um, let me start. So for me, I was previously living in Singapore and before that lived in maybe five or six major places globally. Um, I was very interested in opening up a business and Dubai is a place where it's very easy to do that, to open a business, relocate yourself, your family, hire people. So that was a big driver. Um, also, this seemed like an untapped market for Salesforce specifically. So I thought it's good to get in while, you know, it's growing, while it's not yet mature, you know, the first mover advantage. So those were the kind of two main drivers from my side. Thank you. So this is Tamim. I thank you for having us today, uh, Asher and, and Hemi and, and Georgie. Um, so for me, the move to Dubai was mainly because of uh, family reasons. So um, I actually used to live here around 10 years ago and then moved to the UK. Um, and then at, at one point of time, you know, my, my wife actually grew up here. So, um, we were looking to go back and, you know, have a kind of a family reunion back again. Uh, the city itself is, uh, is, is very modern, um, you know, kind of, uh, uh goes around with, with the kind of style of living that, that we like to have. So, uh, it was, uh, it was, uh, an easy decision for us. You both share, I think, the commonality. Uh, you know, you're, you've lived in most parts of the world. You've, you've hit every continent. I don't know what's left on your book, but, but you, to me, Asher, like you've both experienced London. Uh, I obviously grew up in Manchester, so we're bitter rivals, but you know, many people right now from the UK, like especially the messages that we get, and maybe yourself, to me as well, really want to come out to the Middle East. Like It seems like it, the UK used to be the place that many of us would go, okay, this is where for Salesforce, we're going to relocate. It's a mature ecosystem. It feels like the power has shifted. Do you feel that a little bit as well? That's that's true. I've actually been contacted by several colleagues uh, from, from the ecosystem who asked me about that particular question. 
uh, as as Georgie alluded to, it seems that you know that there is a kind of you know like a, a growth happening in in in, in the region, yep. uh, and there is a, a thinking or you know like a, a kind of uh, people are thinking that is it now the right time to move? Is it now the right time to join? There are multiple openings that are showing up in the market these days. Yep. Um, and of course, you know, like it's uh, it's a place that uh, perhaps several of, of the people that I that contacted me have been to uh, to visit before. So they they know the place. Uh, they kind of liked it, and now they are thinking perhaps we should move our families and, and and work here. On that note, I think for someone that's still finding their way within the Middle East and and the Salesforce ecosystem, you know, I've had the pleasure of working North America, DAC, EMEA, obviously the UK, where I've heard about you many of years and what you've done with some of the biggest SIs and partners. I suppose one question I get a lot, and I'll start with you, Yogi, is what's it like to relocate here in terms of the ecosystem from what you've experienced so far? Because we know, you know, we're still moving. There's still a big transition that needs to be done. But your experience over the last year, what would your perception be of Salesforce right now as it stands? So I might not be the best person to answer this question in, in terms of what is the <laughs> what is the like UAE or Gulf local Salesforce market like because I'm primarily working on the European market. But from my conversations with other people, it seems like it's the market here is primarily SMB sales service cloud implementations or platform. It's different than America's um, APEC, specifically Singapore. Europe, where you'll have a lot more complexity, you'll have, you know, sales service cloud plus marketing cloud, MuleSoft, industry cloud, etc. So the yeah. I would say on average, the level of complexity is smaller. But I think what we're seeing is in the region, um, Dubai World Tour happened this year in May. If anyone is interested in moving here, I would say that's probably the best event to come to. So if you're thinking about it, come for Dubai World Tour next year. I'm guessing it will be in May, but we'll see. Um, and Dubai World Tour this year, they, they told us that compared to last year, there were twice as many people. My guess is that's probably the singest, single biggest year over year growth of any World Tour event. So, I mean, I'm guessing other events, maybe if they grow 20%, that would be good. Here, it's 2x growth. I'm not, so I'm not just making I, it I feel up. like that that is that is showing so the potential true. of this ecosystem. So true. And I think like we met, obviously, at the World Tour, right? And at that point, you know, Yogi can contest for me that I was with Maurizio, who was... You know, someone I did uh, a podcast with for many years. He's maybe watching this when it comes out. I remember at that time not even having the plan fully to move here, but that event and that world tour compared to the base camps years before made me realize that something special is going to happen. And I suppose for coming over to you, to me, like you've experienced one of the biggest ecosystems, if not the biggest ecosystem in Europe. You were there at the prime time when there was major transformation. You worked for some of the biggest partners same question to you. How do you see the ecosystem right now and where do you see the future development of the ecosystem? Yeah, and, and, and I can actually compare it to how it was like 10 years ago. 10 years ago, there were a few Salesforce customers only in the region. I see the number has you know multiplied multiple times uh, today. I'm not necessarily in, into the details these days because I've, you know, like went away from the consultancy world. But but even when I speak, you know, to some uh, colleagues and some friends and, you know, some connections here and there, the number of custo- Salesforce customers has increased significantly in, in, in the region. Uh, I think that's, that, that is also aligned with the fact that Salesforce itself is you know, uh, looking to, to, to penetrate different kind of verticals that it wasn't possible to do that before. There's Hyperforce now and there's AWS that is extending to the region. There's now an opportunity to go after markets and after industries that simply wasn't on the, on, on the radar, wasn't on the table yep. back, you know, 10, 10 years ago. So, um, you know, coming to, 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 to what Georgia mentioned is that, yeah, the, the market seems to be uptaking now in, in, in this region. Um, and uh, yeah, complexity-wise, it's still not there. Uh, but there is, there's what I see also that there is um, there's a particular attention to uh, excellency in in delivery. So it's not just you know um, looking for classic sales or service implementation. Yeah. 
but how can that be actually world leading kind of implementations if if you're looking at service for an example how can we not only enable service for for the customers but how can we enable it on their fingertips how can we make it very easy for them to to engage very interactive to engage yeah. it's it's the next step just jumping immediately you know to the to the to the modern uh, does it remind you slightly to me of the uk like when it for, when the ecosystem and sales i know the ecosystem is more vast now there's a lot more offerings compared to when we started and it was sales and service but do you see that 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 exponential growth where because when we're in london you know when you were working for some of the biggest partners back then there was clients that still didn't adopt salesforce yeah it, it kind of see that wave seems to be appearing now the wave that the, the beginning of that wave is 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 appearing from from what i see uh i think that it, it will take couple perhaps more years until we actually notice uh, the, the significant uptake yeah. but the beginnings are yeah look familiar cool and this is one for you uh, Georgi so you lived in Singapore and you lived in Dubai and both of these places are the expat hubs of the world and they're bringing a lot of amazing talent to both and i say sometimes we do lose a lot of talent to Singapore what have you found the differences like in terms of building a career and now a company in Dubai as opposed to Singapore? Yeah, so maybe let's start with um, lifestyle differences first, and then we'll talk about career. So from a lifestyle perspective, I would say the biggest difference is honestly just greenery. <laughs> in Singapore, you can you know walk on the street. There are trees everywhere. There are a lot of parks you can go to. You know, wild animals everywhere. It's you just feel the nature all around you. Here, it's a bit of the opposite, um, but the you know, from from a good perspective, the tax situation is great. It's just very easy to do everything, super convenient, super safe, although Singapore is also very safe. And um, what I personally like is it's a lot closer to Europe and the rest of the world. It's just way easier to travel to, you know, Europe, Africa, a lot of different locations, whereas it's, you know, from Singapore, it's much farther. So you're just kind of focused on a different area of the world. From a career perspective, I would say that um, the work-life balance here is generally a bit better than what I've seen in in Singapore. So from that perspective, it's nice. The time zone overlap with Europe is also very good. It's between two to four hours, depending on which time zone and if it's daylight savings, but I think very reasonable to support a European project. Whereas in APAC, you're either doing you know an APAC project or maybe Australia and New Zealand. The time zone overlap with Europe or North America is just not really feasible. So it's kind of my my feeling on the the differences so far. Okay, no, that's it's good to know because funny enough, before moving to Dubai, I, I really wanted to go to Singapore. So I was like, I want to go to Singapore. Dubai wasn't even an option for me. And then the opportunity came up in Dubai. I looked at some of the details I'd never been, and I was like, oh, "Let's see, let's see what it's like." And <laughs> it's I, I, yeah, let's, 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 let's give Roll it a go. the dice. I'm pretty honest. With, honestly, I'll probably enjoy it anyway, and I love Dubai. I think Dubai is great. Uh, in the future, you never know. I probably probably will head to Singapore at some point, but uh, it's, it's interesting. Knowing the greenery is one thing. Unfortunately, we don't get so much. Do you think in Dubai. Singapore's lost? Like not lost. It's a, it's a bad way to phrase it, but you know, it had that time, right? That Dubai is now going through. Do you feel like with well, the with the expenses now in Singapore and the amount of investment that's already taken place and the amount of people that have already moved there, that that bubbles first. Well, honestly, I, I read that Dubai is kind of following the Singapore model. They yeah. actually engaged a bunch of consultants that either from Singapore helped, you know, Singapore evolve and develop. And they're kind of following that pattern, taking the lessons learned, taking the best practices and applying all of that. So I think if we take where Singapore was in the 80s or 90s, I think that's where Dubai is today. And just naturally, you know, Singapore is a small island. There's just physically not enough space to put all of the people that want to live there there. Dubai, I think, still has quite a lot of space to expand. And, you know, it's it's not an island. It's in the, in the <laughs> desert. So, you know, we don't have unlimited space, but still there's a lot more room to expand. That, so, that's one thing that yeah. uh, really took me back in Dubai when I first came here and I went to do my medical. You just drive out like 30 minutes and there's literally nothing. Which yeah, is, yeah, yeah, which is yeah. good in a way because there's so much potential to build. Whereas in certain places and cities that I've lived in, it's so dense, you know, and there's nowhere to go anymore. <laughs> and I suppose Singapore, like you said, has become like that, right? I was, I was surprised as well because with Dubai and the pictures don't show you this, there's so many <laughs> gaps of just, there's still desert. 
in, in between the gaps. And you're like, damn, that could be a, a new building, that could be a residential, it could be office space. So I think you're right, Dubai is still in its premature stages and it would be great to see over the next five, ten years what they achieve. Have you seen a, a big change in the last ten years when you lived here before to now to me? Like, did you see buildings and you're like, wow, that didn't exist like ten years ago and I, that street wasn't even there ten years ago? Many, <laughs> many, many. So uh, actually ten years ago, I, I used to work for uh, for a... Uh, a, uh, a property development company okay. here in, 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 in Dubai and at one of the, 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 the big companies over here and at, at one point of time there was a, a maquette on, on one of the meeting rooms that depicts how Dubai land is going to look like. Um, this part of the Dubai is today is, is actually there. I used to live in, in one of these uh, villas in, in, in that uh, region, oh. in Dubai land. So that, that whole place wasn't actually there 10 years ago. It's uh, it's really impressive, yeah. The speed of you know build and and uh, the, the the you know like the infrastructure that has been introduced. That that whole place was was not there ten years ago. But it's like I, I'm not even lying to you guys. I feel like even where I live, like as soon as I look out my window, overnight a building just appears. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't there yesterday. <laughs> On the way here, I said I used to live literally just down the road from, from this location and that Shake Shack was not there at all. There wasn't even a construction site there. Don't be and fooled then, by then, muscles. He, he loves Shake Shack. This, <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and this was only maybe a year ago, which is crazy. There's now a whole functioning restaurant with employees. Uh, it's, to me, that's that's you just wouldn't see that. In it's the opposite the of like you know I love Barcelona, but it was always manana manana, right? So like you you would look at a construction site and then like twenty years later, yeah. Like, yeah, that was still being built twenty years ago. But you've only got to look at Gaudi and Sagrada Familia. <laughs> it's like come on guys, just finish it. Uh, the one thing that I wanted to pivot to, and I'm getting asked this a lot, Yogi, and it's probably more f focused on you. People now, right, within Salesforce, when you look at the SI world, and you know back then working for the top four, whether it be PwC, Accenture, you know, it was a big thing. Now I'm seeing a lot more entrepreneurial spirit in terms of people going out, setting up their own partners, practices, working for themselves. How's that transition been for you, Yogi? Because you worked for the mothership, you worked for Salesforce for many years. You then took a leap of faith, not just on yourself, but also the ecosystem and, and the clients and, and, you know, the way you wanted to work. What advice would you give to someone who wants to do it, but maybe for some reason just hasn't yet, and, and they want to do it specifically within Dubai. Yeah, so um, maybe let me talk about my experience of working in the Salesforce ecosystem from different perspectives. So I started off customer side, then went to an SI, then went to an ISV in the professional services branch of the ISV, then joined Salesforce, now I'm an entrepreneur, so I've been to been in almost all, around, of the, right? <laughs> all of the different roles you can be in in the Salesforce ecosystem. Um, so I, I would say that just having a diversity of experience helps with doing something new. And I mean, if, if you're at a if, if you're at an SI and starting a new project, building a new practice, I mean, you're constantly doing new things. You know, you're helping a customer decide, look, here's a business case. How do I actually realize this through Salesforce? And that's not that different than starting your own business, right? Because ultimately sure. you yourself need to decide on a brand, launch a website, figure out what your niche or specialty is going to be, hire people. It's more or less all the same skills that you would use in the consulting world. It's just... It builds you up for that, right? Yeah, it, it, you're just applying it in a slightly different way. But the core kind of skills that you built through working in Salesforce, solving problems, that all applies. I mean, as, as Salesforce professionals, to me, I don't know what you think, but my day-to-day -day job is solving problems. Yeah. That's ultimately what it is. And as a business owner, I'm also solving problems. Just doing it for your own business now. Yeah. So yeah. I, I think, you know, if you have this desire, try it. Worst case scenario, you fail, your company goes bankrupt, maybe you lose a year or two of your life, but... Think about the flip side. Let's say you wanted to do this for a long time. You decide, oh no, I'm I'm too you know too hesitant hesitant to do it. Twenty years later, you're like, man, I, I really should have done that. You know, the the opportunity cost is huge. I would say so. If you're thinking about doing it, do it. the The cost isn't too high, especially in Dubai. The cost of um, setting up a business, getting kind of all the the bases covered initially would be about ten to twenty k USD. 
So, I mean, it's it's not trivial money, but it's also not huge money. Yep. So it's pretty easy to get started. But the hardest part is just where do you find a customer project to start generating revenue? If you can First solve thing, that yeah. problem, yeah. everything else is super easy to Reach solve. Reach out to Tamima Yogi. <laughs> 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 They'll point you in the right direction. No, but but I, I would like to point out to to an interesting pattern here, and perhaps you remember him when you know, like in the olden days in uh, in, in, in in London, there were several um, I would call small medium kind of companies, consulting companies, SIs mm-hmm. in, the, in the Salesforce ecosystem. Eventually, those SIs got acquired by by bigger companies, and it's now pretty much kind of stable situation over there. Yeah. You see more SIs, uh, sorry, more small medium SIs starting up over here. So I think this is this is you know like coming back again to that repetitive pattern that yeah. that that uh, happened elsewhere. Um, as I mentioned, it's going to be a you know like a a few more years until you know things start to crystallize out. But yeah, there, there is. It's a, so true. You say that to me because even today I can't reveal the the name of the source, but I heard one of the top four was acquiring another partner because they just want to make. An impact in the region and the quickest way to do that as you saw within london was blue wolf and tequila right yeah ibm and Accenture. yeah what did what did they become now you know especially Accenture. when you talk about them being the biggest salesforce partner globally i don't want to put you on the spot but given all your experience and what he just said did it ever go through your mind uh, uh, like two questions did it ever go through your mind <laughs> Because it, it's hard because he's now gone into more of an end client right so it, it's changed because you've gone from consulting most of your career. So that was my first question. Like, how's that transition been for you <laughs> to yeah. be on the other side now? Yeah. And probably know all the tricks and flicks. Yeah. And and I think that that was uh, at one point of my, of, of, of my career, I felt that I actually want to to own the the roadmap and I want to own the vision for a particular area in, yeah. in, in, in an enterprise. Um, it's a different scenario where you know when, when you are in consultancy because you're mainly advocating. You are their trusted advisor. You're advocating for for the best practice, but you don't actually own the the implementation. Um, and in in many cases, you're probably going to switch to another customer in in less than six months. Probably you're probably working with two customers <laughs> at the same time. That's where the overworked <laughs> and extra hours come into. <laughs> right? So uh, at one point of time, I thought, well, now I want to own that vision. I want to own that uh, that roadmap. I want to grow that that practice and see, you know, where it's gonna head. Uh, so so far, it's it's a uh, it was a rewarding journey. It was an interesting journey for me. It's more than just you know. The, the technical side, there's also the human side, the, the, the development of the team, thinking, you know, taking decisions on uh, how exactly are you going to invest in, in the in the talents, yeah. um, in the talent market. For example, we took a, a decision in investing in younger talents and, and developing them. I'm seeing that a lot more, you know, to, which is to, good to see, actually. Uh, yeah, but, but then we, we we built our own kind of internal program to to, to develop these talents, and it was very rewarding. Um, you're so not, you're all of that pe- you you're now on the people everything. side rather than just the technical side. Exactly, right? you own everything, and then if you're gonna make a decision, you're gonna be there to, to reap the consequences. Please tell me you have more work life balance, or is that just a myth? You know, when you well, switch from consulting, <laughs> 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 to me, it's like it's just a myth. It's just a myth. <laughs> I'm working more now. <laughs> Yeah, I mean it's 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 good. It it's, uh, it was an interesting experience, and uh, I think for me at least, it, it was the right decision to make at that point of time. Perfect. Appreciate that to me. And to me, a question for you and someone who's also lived in London and in the UK. What's been the difference in terms of your career, uh, in terms of speed, in terms of how you can progress, and maybe maybe even culturally from Dubai to London? Because because a lot of our audience uh, and a lot of people come to me still now, even though I'm actively cre- recruiting for people to come to Dubai. A lot of people still ask me ask me about London, how amazing London is. I really want to move to London. What would be kind of your advice and thoughts around that? Yeah, uh, I think London is well. It's 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 a it's a, a bit unfair to be honest to compare the the two situations at the moment. As I mentioned, you know, <laughs> I love how we worded that. You like <laughs> at the moment. <laughs> Because <laughs> because uh, the the market here in, in the UAE is on the growing side, while the market in the in the UK is pretty much mature. 
Uh, there's a lot of opportunities in the UK. There are, there are a lot of uh, big customers with, with very complex implementations already in place and are really seeking for, for, for talents. Also, the kind of, you know, the, the market over there is, is a little bit closed. Uh, so unlike the market over here, which is very open to the, to the external world. So, uh, so in, 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 in short, if you're looking to progress, you know, your, your career quickly, uh, or, you know, you're like looking to, to gather more kind of knowledge and more kind of experience, probably London is the, the, the better place. If you already have, you know, good amount of experience and you want to put it in place and then you want to expand to some other, you know, uh, areas, you want to grow further in your career to probably executive levels and, and that sort of things, perhaps you'd consider uh, Dubai in that, in that situation. What about food to me? That's the main question, as you food. can see, looking at me. Yeah, uh, I mean, like, come on, be <laughs> honest about this one. You got... Fish and chips in London and, and many other cuisines to, to Dubai. Hey, I, had to, I had to go with fish and chips to start with. But Indian food is actually the number one, I believe, yes. cuisine yes. within the UK. So just, yes. a, just a little Agreed. fact there for you, Asha. Yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Personally, I think food in London is better. Really? Oh, 100%. The, the thing about... Uh, There's a misconception there then, because everyone, when I was telling them I was moving to Dubai, was like, oh man... You're going to put on this Dubai stone. I was like, already have, buddy. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> been doing that for years. Uh, but then, like, th they think that the cuisine is on a high, high level. Like, no, you two it, tell me yeah, differently. Yeah. Like, yeah. In my opinion, and I, I, not everybody agrees with me for the record, but in my opinion, London, whilst it's overall a more expensive city, I believe you can get food for a more reasonable price. That's really good quality. Whereas Dubai, I feel, like, I feel like if you want good food, you have to pay for I've it. I've spoken like a true Londoner, Asha. In, <laughs> in Manchester, there's no way you're paying £8 for a burger and fries. Uh, you could literally go somewhere and get something for £2. Yeah. I mean, London's expensive, it just, it just is. But you can, you can get food for a reasonable price. Whereas in Dubai, I, I do feel like, especially if you stay in the very touristy areas, the food's fairly international and fairly, fairly generic. And you have to pay to get really good food that's just my that's been my experience there are, there are areas like jlt's got amazing food options where you can get good like food from traditional places but i think overall i think london's got better food and it's got more options you're just a nando's guy right <laughs> <laughs> but you to me yeah well i i think i i uh I, I kind of agree and disagree. I agree that some i actually felt that some of the cuisines in in, in london are actually better Surprisingly, you know, like uh, you, I would expect, for example, the Persian food to be better over here because, you know, of close proximity. Actually, it's better over there. I don't know how, but, but you know, this is how it is. Uh, but I, I actually f uh, find that th there are a little bit, you know, more variety over here. Um, you know, if you're looking for, for kind of international food, uh, I feel that there's more variety and perhaps it's an easier access. So you can go to a one place and you're going to find like 20, 30 different restaurants from different cuisines and different, you know, uh, different levels, let's say, you know, from, from and, and expense for the, for, the, for the food. You'd need to go into multiple places and to get that, that number of restaurants uh, in, in London. You're probably going to need to travel a little bit, you know, across the, the city. Um, here, it's, there are more kind of, you know, centralized, easy access. That's, that's what I find. I still find the apps confusing. I don't know about you, Yogi, but... The options are endless. Like, yeah, the, I, I read you that. You spend like two hours just going through the options, and you still haven't decided what you want at the end of it. Yeah, it's like a cheesecake factory. You know, their menu is like fifty pages. So. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But the problem when you have too many choices is it's very difficult to make a decision. But um, I read that Dubai has the most um, restaurants per capita, or like really? Michelin stars per capita, or something like that. So I, think I it imagine. Might be uh, yeah, I, I imagine you could probably spend like a year going to a different Michelin star restaurant, you know, every day. So I feel like since I've been here, me and you have mainly been at Buffalo <laughs> Wings and Rings in JLT Cluster X. If you need to know where it is, check it out. Oh it's God, an amazing though. place. You'll see us there after this. Uh, <laughs> I think I'm glad we covered food, though, because, it, again, it is something that comes up a lot. Because, again, when I, when I move here, they're like, oh, man, like the food there looks amazing. But I agree with you a little bit, Asher, as well. I think England as a whole given the migration and, and the, the years that you've had different cultures living in the UK, we've evolved a lot, right? It's yeah, not just kebab yeah, shops anymore. Yeah, for the record, I'm, I'm strictly <laughs> speaking about London. The rest of the UK, I can't speak for well, the Manchester did get voted well. best city in England. I don't want to lead on that debate. Maybe that's <laughs> yeah, Yogi backs me on it as well. He's never been, but he's like, I believe you, Hemi. Uh, going back to Salesforce, right? You two 
are people that I think can can give this opinion because in your careers you've you've started at a certain point where you've developed you've learned different skills some of you have specialized in certain areas you know from comms cloud what are the biggest skill gaps that you see now or you you believe you may see going forward because I think Salesforce now as a market it's hard when you're speaking to thousands of candidates who are like oh man there must be loads of jobs in in Dubai and the UAE but I always say it depends on the specific area that you're in within Salesforce so your guys opinions maybe start with you Yogi on the gaps where people can maybe cross train upskill and what you would advise on that yeah, I, I think this goes back to the um, conversation we had earlier about like the UK market and how it started as sales service and progressed to kind of more complexity. We're kind of seeing the same thing here. So there's um, a critical mass of sales service and platform projects and people that know that. But as companies are going to make huge investments in digital transformations mm -hmm. with communications cloud, for example, they will need the skills of people that have delivered communications cloud in the past. And there are very few people here on the ground that have done that. So I think that's the biggest skill gap. People, people that have done that level of complexity project in you know, other markets that can bring best practices, lessons learned, et cetera, here so that companies here will be successful, avoid the mistakes that have been made in the past, that sort of thing. So I feel like actually a very good pattern would be if you, um, for now, if you kind of grow your skill set in a more mature market, get a very good expertise in a more mature market, then come here and bring that expertise here, I think you will be super valuable. If you're just another sales service cloud developer, you're going to be one of a million people that are Given where we are for, regionally as well, yeah. right? Do you feel soft skills is, is a big gap here? Given that you both have got to CTA status. And I remember going, <coughs> sorry, to your first, to my first event here in Dubai, where I had five CTAs all in one room on a panel, which is something in 10 years I haven't seen, which is insane. Uh, and you touched upon it, I think, to me in your book and, and you were talking and people are asking you about the technical, but you were mentioning also the other side of it, right? Yeah. The business side of it and un speaking the customer's language and being in front of a C-level stakeholder and being able to communicate. Is that something that you've seen yourself as well working for such a large, large organization now. Yeah, absolutely. Soft skill is, is definitely, uh, soft skills are definitely, you know, essential for, 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 for the business. And they are the carrier that can elevate you further in, in, in your career. And uh, you, you, you touch based on some of them. So the ability to understand, you know, the business challenges that actually un understand what is their pain point and then map it to something yeah. in, in in Salesforce that solution architecture I think that's that's that capability to to build a solution or to imagine how the solution would work end-to-end -end is definitely a, a skill that is uh, and will continue to be on demand in the Salesforce ecosystem and in the software ecosystem in general the ability to think of the solution end-to-end Think how exactly it's going to work. Don't worry. Uh, don't don't be bothered about the separation here of roles that the industry itself has created. If the, somebody's going to tell you, oh, this is a UX role, oh, this is a whatever role, doesn't matter. As long as you can imagine that solution end to end, and then walk the client and walk the, the whoever it is to 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 reach out that stage, then that is an essential skill that will always be valued. Now. Other, there are other skills that, that that are also in demand that I see in, in the market. The technical uh, architecture, the the the, arch, the 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 people that can take this vision and then add the, the technical aspect to it, uh, ensure that the solution is built in a scalable fashion. Scalable fashion. I'm going to repeat that again. Scalable and extendable fashion. Future embracing. This is very very essential. Don't live just for the day. You need to think and you need to put yourself in the shoes of your customer to think how you can take them to 2030. Well, you need to build something that is scalable and can deliver value up to uh, several years to come and can be extended left and right to do so. So that that skill is also um, very important. The other skill that I would like to touch base on is those that, that is related to artificial intelligence. So artificial intelligence is is 
you know, continue. I'm not going to say booming it because it's, it has been booming for a while now. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's continued to, to, to boom and continue to unfold into other opportunities. Now we have generative AI as, as for an example. But there's a lot of noise in the market and the ability to um, be able to detect the right use cases for the right business and be able to actually, you know, take that business into the journey in adopting the right, you know, AI technology, that is going to be the next thing in the coming few years. Super interesting, man. Really good tips there. I think anyone who's in that space, probably we're going to get messages. <laughs> can, 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 <laughs> I, like, can I add one more thing? So, um, Asher, sure. we were talking about this earlier about the importance of personal branding. I feel like that is one thing that is also missing. Can you show your new business card while you do that? Sorry, guys. I think this is epic. He was, he was coming from North Africa dreaming and I get a message from Yogi and he's like, dude, I've got the business card. Check it out. Yeah. So it's like an NFC business card. So people we're can not just even like trying to promote any sponsors. <laughs> yeah. like, but generally, I, I think like, you know, it's cool. I need to, uh, if discovered, Lauren, if you're watching, uh, <laughs> need to get to this one. Uh, yeah. But I, I feel like the, you know, it's one thing to be a good professional and be, you know, the best in your field or whatever. But if no one knows about it, then what does it even matter, right? So um, I think early in my career, I also didn't realize this, how important it is to not only do a good job, but also tell other people about the good job that you're doing. And I feel like that's something that all of us can probably do better. I think I can do better, but that's that's one place. You've improved, you you, you definitely yeah. improved. Ash, like you have done great on this, like not just within the, the tech recruitment world, but obviously like, you know, when you look at what you're doing with your app and your your business in that sense any advice that you would give for personal branding because i feel like you're following and i think you posted i'm not even just uh giving him a bigger ego here uh i think he hit like i think two million i think a million and a half million and a half so any any advice because i feel like we're doing the event obviously with you know speakers from salesforce we've got some big names on the 23rd which the uh, discovered will be sponsoring but it's still a very delicate topic but it's hard when you're you're sitting with people from the tech world and you're like okay you've got to post on linkedin more uh you know you've got to think about this you've got to think about that and they're like but why i've got 20 years experience i've got 20 certifications from your perspective how can someone work on their personal branding whether it be social media face to face just well, some tips. i think there's ma- there's many different ways to do personal branding social media is one of the best ways and i think for anybody who wants to excel in their career, it is important to focus on your personal branding because when you speak to, let's just say I'm having a conversation here, I'm, I'm reaching three people. Unfortunately, we have cameras here, so now I'm reaching many. So it's just about increasing your chances of opportunity, increasing your increasing the amount of people who know what you do and know that you're good at what you do, I think is important in today's world. And we're, we're blessed to have social media. So you can speak to, I can have one conversation, but I'm speaking to many people at the same time. So I think anybody who wants to build their personal brand, I think LinkedIn's one of the least competitive of all of all social media platforms so i think linkedin's it's, it's a growing platform it's rapidly growing and there's a lot of people who want to build their social brand on linkedin but still aren't i think it's one of the easiest in my opinion to really get views and build relationships with people and um, there's not not all of the social media platforms are built so you can have conversations with people easily and you have access to people at a high level easy um if you dm most people with loads of followers on on instagram you probably won't get a reply on linkedin there's a lot higher chances and you can develop relationships quite quickly so i'd recommend to anybody post at least a couple of times a week and make sure these post for me i just like to have conversations with people but i'm speaking to many so i just write how i speak because i'm speaking to humans so i just write how i speak and and it seems to work and and people being your natural self yeah yeah because i feel like on linkedin ash and, and maybe you two can attest to this as well I always tell people that you've got to be your authentic self. Like, you know, people who know me think over the last three months, they've seen many pictures of me and Yogi, whether it'll be in wings and rings or, you know, trying to be me. And I think when you meet and actually have in-person conversations, the true you and the mass will come off. You're very authentic from what I've seen with your branding, with Stratus Carter, you know, in your business, I've seen it, you know, with the book and everything that you did with the release. It seemed like people are buying into you, not just the book. Like, have you seen... Is that something that you would advise people that to just let themselves be themselves on LinkedIn? And, and yeah, yes, it's professional yeah, yeah, to, to and you have to take it to a certain extent, yeah. but it's not Instagram or Facebook, but you can be a bit more yeah, free. 100%. Before the professionals are people, 
So yes, you have to be a little bit more professional on LinkedIn as opposed to other platforms, but you can still show personality. You can still, I just literally write how I talk and I'm pretty formal anyway. So for me, that's, that's not too much of an, of an issue, <laughs> but in general, you just write how you talk and people should relate to that and just be consistent with it. Make sure you're adding value to other people's posts too, making sure you're liking, making sure you're sharing, making sure that you comment on, on other people's posts and when you give enough, then you will receive back. And I, I think that's the, the easiest way to do LinkedIn, it's just relationships. LinkedIn. And, and memes, uh, Yogi and Tamim, if you've not followed Asher yet, <laughs> oh, yeah. I think after this you will. Yogi, he made you look like Joe Rogan today, so. <laughs> <laughs> nice. uh, memes for Asher, definitely. Have. Yeah, but again, yeah. authentic self, right? Yeah. Like, I think when me and you had a conversation, I didn't even move to Dubai, Yogi. I was. We met at the Taj, funny enough, in JLT, where my office is literally one minute away now. Uh, and I was, and I said to Yogi, I was like, "Like, we, let's take a picture, dude." And I think that picture got X amount of views. And you know, like, I think since then, one thing I've noticed, and to me, I wanted to bring you on this, right? You are one of the few within the Salesforce world that actually took the initiative to not just develop a book, but publish it not once, but twice. It did very well. It's helped a heck of a lot of people being at that user group recently you could see the impact it had had on people's careers genuinely like i remember one person actually said it was because of you they actually went down that road can you can you expand on that and also two-part question as it's me and i always ask you two-part questions what's next to follow that like have you had a have you had like a message from anyone where they're like, all right, to me, you've done one book now, like anything else in the mix? Yeah. Any, yeah. any, any juicy reveals that you can put on the podcast today? <laughs> sure. So, and I think, you know, like it's, uh, it was really kind of heartwarming, you know, to, 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 to hear these messages, you know, from, uh, from professionals that, that have reached so far, you know, in, in, in their career. Um, there was actually another incident that happened on, on the same day where, um, Another professional, you know, kind of approached me and said, you know, like, uh, thank you for, for your contributions, etc. Um, and he mentioned, like, you know, ask, how can I get into the, the CTA track? What can I learn? You know, how can I prepare for the, for the CTA exam uh, as I'm working for a smaller company and I don't have a mentor? So that was exactly the moment where, you know, I've, I've, I've you know, literally handed over a copy of the book. I said, this is exactly why I created the book for. I created the book for particularly for those that are looking for a CTA mentor. It's, you know, like when, when you are working for in, in some specific places, particularly, you know, the, the bigger uh, SIs, there are several CTAs yep. that, that can Center coach of you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They can coach you. They can, they can mentor you. Uh, I mean, you might, like, because of the high demand, you might not get enough, you know, sessions or something, but th there are people that you can reach out to and there are people that you can learn from. But for those that do not have access to such luxury, um, this is why, why I created the book. Uh, I created it so that they can have something that can talk to them and can walk them into the, what, what to expect. Um, and to your second part, um, to your second question, um, actually, I'm, I'm, I'm working on, a, on another book, which is targeted for those more junior uh, professionals who wants to get into the or who actually got into the, the Salesforce ecosystem, let's say a few months ago. And they want to start their, their, their journey. They want to um, use Salesforce as a rapid application development environment. It's very known as a CRM. They have, you know, CRM is actually their, uh, their, their code on, on, on stock exchange, but, uh, but it's, it's a very powerful platform for rapid application development. Uh, while you're learning to become a CTA, you learn specific practices and you learn specific activities and you, you learn how to do things in a specific way. I find that the easiest way to prepare for that is to embed that into your day-to-day -day activity. The sooner you can start embedding these into your day-to-day -day activity, the easier and the, the simpler and the, the better. So starting so, so early, that you right? don't need, Yeah, start early so that you don't need to unlearn things. You start okay. early by, by starting doing this. So you have a task to do one thing, how to, to start tackling that, that particular challenge. Start by creating this, start by creating that. So this is this is what that book is is is, is meant for. It's meant for uh, the more kind of um, let's say younger generation of, of professionals who are getting there into the, the platform. They want to learn, but they also are looking forward to grow one day to become you know CTAs or 
whatever kind of you know Salesforce professionals that that that, that they find their heart. That's to super do. interesting to me, like because getting into the ecosystem is hard in itself, but then you know people pick up bad habits, right? There's the your, the people you work with may have taught you a certain way. I mean, we see it in our industry all the time, right? Like you've come from one of the biggest institutions before, discovered with tech systems and. It's hard to change those behaviors later on when they want to go on and achieve X. So you heard it here first. New book on the way. <laughs> Any dates, or are we still still early into the process? Uh, we, we're, we're, no, well, not actually early, but there's no firm date yet. Um, I'm still hoping for Q1 next year. Okay. Okay. Cool. Great exclusive there. Yogi, over to you on that one. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the one thing that I wanted to touch on, and Ash can take us out. When I went to that user group and and the five of you including you know some of the other ctas who are exceptional people as well uh what you had to give up really resonated with me and and we were talking about this in the car in terms of sacrifice people that come to dubai you know they yeah. get lost in the, the lifestyle or it, it becomes so hectic that you live for the day to day and stuff that you do said about what you gave up family who sacrificed for both of you to get to where you are you know the lack of sleep the lack of time to do anything else like is that i just wanted to touch on it because i again i don't think people see that side of it they just see the the reward and all that side but they didn't see what you had to go through has that shaped you even to this day like the discipline that you instilled becoming ctas has that really taken you to the point now where for example running your own business being a leader of a top organization and managing the people you do has made you who you are yeah, I think um, one of the one of the really defining things for me was when I moved to Singapore. I was on a very difficult project where we were working eighty plus hours a week. You know, like sixteen hours during the week, and then eight plus hours on the weekend every day, and it was just really brutal. But after going through something like that, it gives you perspective on how great normal life is in comparison. <laughs> <laughs> where you know, I was I was happy to just exit the apartment and go to the hawker center grab food and come back that was just like the highlight of my day and we then, laugh about that but <laughs> think about that dude you didn't have time to even leave your apartment to just grab something to eat yeah and then after going through something like that then the other smaller challenges in life feel like nothing in comparison so that was kind of a defining thing for me and then cta came immediately after that project which was also <laughs> <laughs> which was also quite difficult so for a cta i was you know working probably like 60 hours on customer stuff during the week and then on top of that 20 to 40 hours of cta preparation um, in the evenings and on the weekend so again you know not really having time for myself or my family to enjoy life all of that um, so I think going through those challenges is hard while you're doing it, but I think it really shapes you as a professional and uh, individual. And Especially as an owner now of a business where you're responsible for other people, right? And you have to handle that in a certain fashion as a boss. And, and it, it, it doesn't get any easier, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> that, that was the follow-up, like, does it get easier? <laughs> to me, he's like, nope, no, no, it doesn't. I, I think it, it only gets easier in the sense of, you know, I've tackled all of these big challenges before, I can tackle this one. So it gives you more confidence that... Is it the rationale as well, the way yeah. you think and, and like the, the emotional side of it, like the fact that you have the capacity now to deal with these things and know that they're, they're little bumps... Or little, yeah, it's like if, if, if no one's dying, it's not serious. You know, yeah. it, it feels serious in the day to day. But if, if someone's not dying, we're we're OK. So same for you to me. Like, was, was that was that one of the in, in your Salesforce journey, maybe even personal? Like, was that one of the the hardest struggles or did you find like you just dealt with it in a certain way and you had a certain mindset of determination that I'm going to do this? Um. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to come back, come, come, come with, a, with a different perspective, to be honest here. Um, so it, it took me a while. I mean, I've, I've actually done my CTA a little bit, you know, in the, in the early days yeah. where there was very little of resources available. I think you were like um, one of five at that time to me. <laughs> <laughs> not, 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 not that old. But, uh, but yeah, um, so it, it took me a while until I understand what is actually is expected during that exam how is that exam going to look like and then you know after that things started to become a little bit easier because uh, i knew exactly what what i'm expected to do i started to practice on them now that that hard practicing and you know like the, the hard work obviously you know kind of shape your personality and and you know help you kind of have a right kind of mindset um but the the the, the exam itself um 
it it was one of the kind of uh, pleasant experiences that I actually had uh, really? in, in my life. Yeah, I mean, I, I actually Smiling enjoyed it. it. Like I, it I enjoyed it. Like, <laughs> you're like, he's like, what's wrong with you? I, I, I wouldn't use the word pleasant to describe the experience. I don't That's know, why I, we got both of you today, because there's two different sides of the coin. I, I actually enjoyed it. I enjoyed every moment. Uh, for me, you know, like it was, um, uh, it was an opportunity to, to, to take a shot, you know, like, and, and, and try to do this. It, it's frustrating, obviously, and, and there's a lot of pressure, but you need to think, you know, these are the people, the, the judges in, in, in that case, these are the people that I used to look up to, and today I'm presenting to them, and I'm convincing them that, you know, I'm good, I'm, I'm, I, I have what it takes to Comes be to there. Earth moment, right? Uh, it, it was actually, uh, for me, and I'm, that, that part, particularly the presentation part, was actually uh, an enjoyable how, how many times did you rehearse if any for that moment like when you had to go in front of the panel did you did you practice in front of your your wife like did you look in the mirror like a uh, hundred times <laughs> <laughs> no but but i think you know like you need to do some some mocks so that that's where why the mocks are very important okay mocks and then you present that the full mock basically that uh you have to do i find like you know between eight and and you know uh maybe 15 or something like that um that's Kind of, you know, the the, the range that I, w I would I would say would be would be uh, common, uh, but again, you know, like if you like to do more, uh, it, it really depends on on, on you. Uh, yeah. If you like to do less or more, it really depends on 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 you and how how much you are, feel prepared. But yeah, I've done I've done my fair share of, of mocks before going. I feel, I feel like the way that Yogi and and Tamim talk about doing the CTA is is like me and you when we talk about the gym. Like Ash is like. Yeah, it's enjoyable, man. I found it amazing. It's pleasant. And I'm like, I'm dying here. Like, <laughs> Ash, what are you talking about? Like, body's in pain. And he's like, no, but I love this. Like, yeah, like but yeah, I mean, Ash, you probably relate to that, right? Uh, I know, you know, people watching, we've, we've dropped a lot of knowledge here. I think Ash wanted to take us out. I think anything else you want to add to these two, two gents, legends? As, of course, we work in the talent field, I think it would be good for our audience to know. As, as especially since you guys are both two influential leaders in your space, if you're looking, if you were, were to look for some talent, what would you look for in particular? Well, um, so for me, I was interviewing people a lot at Salesforce, and this is my personal opinion, not you know the Salesforce <laughs> official sanction you don't work opinion there anymore, or whatever. <laughs> um, but uh, I actually really enjoy interviewing. By the way, if if you have ever thought about interviewing or haven't even considered it, it's it's a great way to kind of see. To, to be on the other side of the table instead of being the interviewee, to be the interviewer and understand kind of when someone is presenting their experience, kind of how you take um, how you take that as the interviewer. And then that gives you a better way to as an interviewee to present yourself better, that sort of thing. Um, so definitely look at being an interviewer if you haven't done it before. You're actually experience. a great interviewer. So for the people that don't know, just the sidestep, when I, when I worked with Salesforce a lot, Yogi would interview a lot of the candidates and at that time I didn't know him so at that time I would just see his name go on LinkedIn and I was just like okay guys so you're speaking to a CTA uh good luck <laughs> all the best with it but you know what the the opposite in the way you came across and the, I think the way you interviewed them put them at ease uh and I appreciate you taking many of them at that time. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, and I, I think this comes back to um, what we were talking about earlier, where Salesforce is really about problem solving. So for me, when I'm interviewing someone, I want someone that's a good problem solver. Like, I'll ask a bunch of scenario-based questions. I don't really care if you give me the right answer, but I want to see your thought process. If your thought process is logical, you know, you present me with like three different options, you explain the pros and cons of each option, you say, you know, I would go with this option because of X, Y, Z, even if it's not the right answer, if your thought process is logical, you're able to explain it in a way that I can understand that a customer can understand that for me means you're a great candidate. So it's how you get there, not just the answer. It's and, and I would say in CTA, um, from my perspective, they're really testing the same thing. I mean, I think the correct answer matters more there, but it's not only to get the correct answer, you need to be able to explain why is that the correct answer. If you get, give the correct answer without the why, it's 
it's meaningless. That's interesting, man. To mean for you, I mean, you've, yeah. you've got one of the biggest teams. <laughs> I, I, I <laughs> don't know how you do it. Yeah. I, I completely second what, 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 what Jorge mentioned here regarding problem solving. To me, that is absolutely the number one thing that I'll be looking for in, in the candidates. Uh, their ability to, to think in a, in, a, in a logical way. To me, even if they don't actually answer correctly, but they try that in a logical way to, to answer correctly, uh, that 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 is a point given, you know, like that. Uh, in, in my opinion, uh, there is also that uh, to me that the attention to details is very important. The willingness to dive into the details is 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 very important. Because um, regardless of, of the position, I'm expecting that the candidate to be able to dive in and out of the details as needed. Um, so I'm expecting that to be, to be able to dive to the details, even if they are not necessarily going to do that in their, in their most of the time in their day-to-day -day activity. Um, of course, you know, like the the rest of the kind of professional attitude and and um, likability, you know, right? yeah, likability is, is is kind of you know taken. But yeah, problem solving, uh, ability to dive into the details, uh, authenticity, um, yeah. Some gems, some gems, guys. Do you know what, Ash? I'm so happy we did this, you know, great new studio here at Podstar in Dubai with two legends. To have you in the same room, gentlemen, has been a pleasure for me. Like, you know, I think it's still surreal given that I've only been in Dubai two months and I think we're going to be around each other a lot more. There's a lot more events coming up on the 23rd. We've got a huge event to mean. Please, I would love for you to be there. Uh, Ash, you're definitely going to be there now uh, reading Tamim's book and studying Yogi's profile. Uh, <laughs> but guys, look, thanks for having us. Uh, Thanks for being here, Ash. Appreciate you. I hope you enjoyed the Disrupt in the Future podcast, episode three, season one. Thanks for watching. Until next time, peace.